The first major type is called IPTV. The IP stands for Internet Protocol in the network layer of the protocol stack. Okay, and TV is just TV, okay, television. So when we say this is an IPTV service, we really mean that it is delivered over a private and managed network that runs IP protocol, but nonetheless is not the public internet. Uh, in its entirety. It may use part of the public internet, but uh, it consists of a private and managed network that is uh, paid for, deployed by an internet service provider. Okay, An ISP it could be a cable company, it could be a phone company, and so on. And often there is a set-top box STB on the consumer premises. And in the old days, okay, TV was delivered uh, by broadcast over the air, by satellites, or through cables. So why is it switching now to uh, IP technology? And this is a, a powerful example of the phenomena of IP convergence that happened in the uh, early part of the, uh, the century. One reason is cost reduction. Okay, as you consolidate into a uniform platform based on IP, then it can reduce cost. Another is flexibility. As we've seen that IP uh, greatest strength is that its ability to support diverse applications and needs arising in the future. And the third is that the compression technology has gotten better and better over the last 20 years for video, such that at this point the access network capacity uh, can tolerate uh, video, uh, TV distribution. Now. So that is the switch from the traditional satellite or over the air into IP-based TV. And this is a typical picture showing the main component. This is a home, another home, another home. This one might be uh, using a cable modem okay, through a customer premise equipment CPE and it's connected into a set -up box on your TV and then a Wi-Fi gateway for the rest of your data traffic in your home. And this one is connected through a passive optical network. Okay, so the physical medium is not a cable uh, line, but a fiber optic line. And this goes into an optical uh, network unit, uh, which again is connected to TV and to Wi-Fi gateway. And this one goes through DSL, which is a copper-based broadband access into a DSL modem, which in turn goes to set -up box and Wi-Fi gateway. Now, next lecture, we'll talk a lot about these Wi-Fi, including in-home and public area Wi-Fi access points. Then, this is the access network part. Okay, it may cover in each distribution area somewhere between you know around 32 to 128 kind of uh, uh, houses, and this then goes into uh, metro and then backbone network. Skipping quite a few hops, we reach uh, a video serving head end. And this head end may be connected to a local antenna that can receive signals from local TV stations. And these are then connected into a super head end. Uh, usually there are just a few in a country like US, which has a big satellite dish that can get the uh, content signal distributed via satellites. And you, as you can see, that uh, there are a lot of equipments, both on the access part and also on the uh, backbone content delivery part that's uh, deployed by a company such as a cable or phone company. In contrast, another way of using the internet for video, video is VOI, okay, video over the internet. In this case, all you need is a big data pipe leading into the user, and then they can build application overlays to deliver the video you want. So this is delivered over a public network, okay, or in perhaps some strict sense of the word over the internet. Okay. It is not delivered over a managed private network. And there are a few variances, variations. One is a client-server based architecture. For example, YouTube or uh, say ABC, BBC, and so on. Okay, and they don't charge you a fee. They have other business model to support their operation. Another par possibility is client-server based architecture, but they will charge you a fee. For example, Amazon Prime 
or Hulu Plus or HBO Go or Netflix. Right? So they will, may charge you a monthly or annual uh, fee. And the third type is a P2P. Okay? And often they are free, for example, BitTorrent or PP Lives. So there are different business or revenue model for them, and then they have to also pay, even though they don't have to build their own network, they do have to pay for the content they are delivering. Okay, often these companies have to strike some special deal with the owner of the content. They have to still buy servers. We'll see both content servers and control servers. They may have to lease or buy network capacity. Okay, they may also roll out some. Uh, customer premise equipments, although they may also just leverage existing mobile devices like your phone or tablet. And then, of course, they have to pay for the software that monitors their services and configures uh, the video delivery. Now, whether you're talking about IPTV or video over the internet, as we see here in this picture, okay, with the source of the video could be your own camera, okay, or could be your phone. And then uploading through the internet to a video server, okay. For example, Facebook server. Okay? Then through the internet, it is cached in different places and they're ready to get play out. Then through the internet, uh, people want to view the video. Will grab those content, okay. Either way, uh, they have to face the question of quality of video. Okay? Unlike just other kind of data traffic. Um, the video is something that people can visually uh, experience. So they care about the quality, which consists of quite a few components. Part of quality is determined by bit rate slash distortion, because usually everything else held constant. Higher bit rate would give you less distortion. But the relationship is not a linear. Okay, it's not like I double my bit rate and I will always have. The distortion metric, whatever that might be, we'll see an example later in this lecture. Okay, it is not a linear relationship. Okay, the kind of relationship it shows up is called the ray distortion curve, and the ray distortion curve R as a function of d. We will see that in a minute. And the kind of bit rate that's required depends on quite a few things. For example, the amount of motion in the picture. Okay, if there's uh, too much. Uh, motion in a video is an uh, action film, then uh, you demand higher quality. If it's a talk show, then uh, a lower bit rate will still give you a similar visual impact. It depends on the screen resolution. Okay, um, If you're upgrading to retina display, then uh, your eyes will be spoiled and say, hey, I can't go back to look at the original screen. Once you're used to HD on your uh, big TV screen, then you can go back. Another key element is the ratio between viewing distance and the screen size. Okay, if you view too closely, A is not good for your eyes, and B is actually uh, going to detect some kind of defect. Okay, you see the pixelation and so on, non-uniformity of the colors, uh, but most people don't view it that way. It's not pleasant in any case. So there's a reasonable ratio between these two numbers you uh, would maintain. Another factor is the efficiency of uh, compression. Okay? If you have a, a more advanced, a smarter, more efficient compression, as we will see in a minute, then uh, you can uh, get a lower bit rate for the same amount of distortion. Or alternatively, use the uh, same bit rate to get a much lower distortion. It also depends on the kind of content we're talking about. Okay? For a standard uh, definition, we usually uh, need something like one megabit per second, one to two megabit per second, for a reasonable combination of these uh, factors. Okay. And a typical movie would take something like one to two gigabyte. Now, for HD, however, this is SD HD. We need usually uh, at least six to eight megabit per second. Uh, but if you want a true HD. Uh, quality, then usually you need something more like 20 to 25 megabit per second. And a typical uh, movie at this bit rate would take something like 5 to 8 gigabyte for HD. 
And then now people are talking about 3D, uh, holographic, and ultra HD. So ultra HD, you pretty much can see the pixelation. And usually you need a factor of four above uh, a true HD. So something like 100 megabit per second. Now you may think this is a very big number, 100 times of SD, but of course your view experience is much better. And plus, uh, this actually incorporates uh, a huge factor of compression uh, capability, without which you do need two or three orders magnitude uh, higher throughput, which is really not deliverable uh, in any access network today. Now, is 100 megabit per second, or maybe let's say 25 megabit per second, deliverable in today's technology of the access network? Well, it depends. Okay, uh, for certain kind of VDSL, certain fiber-based uh, delivery. And for certain kind of Wi-Fi, say uh, 802.11n, uh, okay, you can reach uh, over 100 megabit per second. Okay. And for your wireline access, if you want to get to 25 megabit per second, uh, most of the uh, latest broadband technology over uh, different media can manage that. Okay. But if you want to go much higher than this, uh, it's going to be uh, quite a challenge. Now, on your cellular network, we're going to talk about that in Lecture 19, the actual application layer speed that you can expect. Uh, even with 4G LTE, okay, it would be hard to achieve this. Achieving this actually is possible. Okay, It depends on other factors, but it is at least feasible in the coming month and couple of years that you can expect to be able to uh, watch uh, reasonable quality HD-like kind of video on LTE if you are at a good spot, uh, and definitely be able to watch SD uh, video on LTE. Now, all this is about the bit rate. How many bits per second can you play back? There are also other factors, for example, delay, such as how long do I have to buffer this? We'll see an example of how buffer smooth is uh, the playback experience, as well as the variance of delay. Okay. And this is important because, well, video is a motion picture. If the relative timing across the frames uh, becomes an issue, then you will see, say, frozen screens and so on. So now the questions are, A, how can the pipe take on so many bits per second? In fact, without compression, the raw data rate of even standard uh, television would not be available today uh, on today's technology. So how can the pipe take on so many bits per second? A second question is, how do I keep track of different state of the video? Unlike a normal, like a standard file, now I have to keep track of play and pause, fast forward and reverse, so on. The third question is, how do I support different qualities of service over best effort network? Remember, we talked about in lecture 13 that the internet is so-called best effort or no effort to guarantee. So how can it ever support something like video? Isn't that amazing? In the advanced material part of the lecture, we'll talk about this. But in the next two modules, we'll talk about the other two questions.